When I finished high school, I went to Calcutta to volunteer in Mother Teresa's hospice around the corner from where my father was born. It was a test to see if I could be a doctor, and I think I passed. Uh, at the time, India seemed like a world apart from my experience, the experience of my life in Canada. But since then, these worlds have grown closer together, and India is a place teeming with new ideas and maybe solutions to some of our problems. My research is focused on the needs of two groups. Let me start with the gentleman on the left. Of the 2.6 billion people that live on $2, less than $2 a day, 500 million of them live in India. India's population is aging, chronic disease is rising, and a growing middle class is increasingly demanding. But there's still very little spending on health care. Now let's turn to the gentleman on the right. Health spending in Ontario rose from $30 billion to $47 billion in the last 10 years. This is fueled by increasing demand, and in, in part, and an increasing number of people with multiple chronic conditions. Now we can continue to increase spending, but given the budget crunch, it would mean cutting into education, social services, and a whole bunch of other things that matter as much to health as health care. So but India and Ontario both have the challenge of trying to creating a health care system that can meet the needs of the people and be affordable. Innovation has been held up as a possible solution to this problem, but not, they're not all equally useful. Sustaining innovations are new ways of doing things that are slightly better but cost a whole lot more, just like many of the drugs coming onto the market. Disruptive innovations are appro new approaches that are cheaper, simpler, and make things more accessible. India is getting particularly good at developing these because they have to make their rupees go a long way. For us, developing ways that are new ways of doing things that are uh, cheaper, just as good but a whole lot cheaper, is going to require a change in mindset. The classic disruptive innovation is the shift from $100,000 mainframe computers that fill the floor of a building to a $2,000 personal computer that sits on a desktop. Now, it's the simpler, cheaper model that is the standard. So what can we learn from India? They've been able to develop $2,000 cars and $35 laptops. Hospitals in India that can now do $2,000 heart surgery and $35 cataract surgery. So how do they do this? Well, through disruptive innovations. This requires a technology that simplifies and a business model to help it spread. So let's start with the disruptions in disease treatment. As medical knowledge advances, treatments become more predictable and can be performed by people with lower skills. In low-income settings where there are few doctors, they systematically shift tasks to the least qualified person who is able to do the job. If we look at the care of HIV, uh, in, initially it took 10 pills and very complex treatment measurements to manage. Now it's one pill once a day. So over the last 15 years, the treatment went from specialists to family doctors and now to nurses in Africa doing the integrated management of HIV with comparable results. Uh, here we've applied the principle of the use of blood thinners. So there's these blood thinners, we're trying to prevent blood clots, so we have to get the right dose. Uh, if the dose is too low, you've got, your, you've got blood clots. If the dose is too high, you've got bleeding. So that started, in, initially was done by cardiologists, then family doctors, then nurses using, using protocols. And this year, a series of studies were released to show that patients can do this with even better results. Systematically shifting care to the most, least expensive and most available person who can manage it is gonna require a shift in thinking, but could save us a lot of money. The challenge here is that it's gonna require uh, revising scope of practice something which we rarely do in our system. Okay, so now let's think about how we spread these. There's new technologies, how do we spread them? Well, these are through novel business models. Clayton Christensen of the Harvard Business School describes three different business, sort of generic business models to support innovation. The first one is the solution shop. This is an organization with highly skilled people who can handle any problem that comes through the door. You can think of high-end law firms or tertiary teaching hospitals. The next model is the value-added process. This is an organization that does the same thing over and over again, constantly tweaking it to make improve quality and reduce cost. It's the standard model in manufacturing and has been used in the Shouldice Clinic uh, just near here that does, uh, focuses only on hernia repairs. And the third model is the facilitated network. 
This is a platform for exchange. So you think of eBay, uh, it provides a platform for people who want to sell things to get in touch with people who want to buy them. A friend of mine's uh, son was recently diagnosed with craniosynostosis. This is a premature fusion of the, member of the bones of the skull. Happens in one in 2,000 children. She'd never heard of it, and she didn't know anyone who had it. But she went to sick kids, she met with a neurosurgeon, he explained the surgery that uh, would be done, and explained the, the benefits and the risks, and she went home profoundly troubled. So she went online, and she found a site called Patients Like Me. And on that site, she read testimonials of people who'd been through the same experience. She could see pictures of their children before and after the surgery, and she'd even chat with them. That information was, allowed her to go through with it and make the decision to do the surgery. And this was extremely valuable medical information available at hardly any cost. So, <clears throat> so how do we move forward with these models? I'm going to start with the value-added process. This man here is Dr. Devi Shetty, uh, the, the man the Wall Street Journal calls the Henry Ford of heart surgery. He was personal physician to uh, Mother Teresa, and his experience with her led him to want to find ways of making heart surgery cheaper because heart disease is the number one killer in India. So he founded a hospital called Narayanarudayalaya. They're able to provide heart surgery for $2,000, less than half the Indian, hospital, or the Indian average for private hospitals, and a fifth of what we charge here. They do over 3,000 surgeries a year, which is more than four times the largest centers in Canada. Now, the thing you need to know about surgery is higher volumes are associated with higher quality and lower cost. By focusing on high volumes, you're able to do uh, rare procedures become more common, surgeons can improve their skills, and they focus on what they're good at and allows you to delegate tasks. Another organization that's applied this principle is the Aravind Eye Care System, the largest eye care provider in the world. They do over 200,000 cataract surgeries a year. So how do they get these kind of volumes? Well, uh, one of the main things is through process redesign. So you can see here, this is the operating room, and the uh, surgeon is here performing a cataract which she's able to do in seven minutes. While, she preps the, while she's doing this case, uh, the next patient is getting prepped. So she does that case, she slides over, does the next case, and back and forth and back and forth, doing up to 50 cases a day. Now they do such high volumes, uh, by, by doing such high volumes, they're able to actually refine their processes. And they developed a cataract surgery that doesn't require sutures. So the surgery is faster, cheaper, and fewer infection rates. Now, when you look at an, at an operating room with four beds in it, you might say, what about infections? Well, their rates are four per 10,000 as compared to five per 10,000 in the UK. And this is partly because you're able to track things and you're able to tweak things and see what the outcome is. Okay, so these are solutions to uh, wait list type problems, right? So how can we apply this in Canada? We've got wait lists. People are waiting for cataracts and uh, other surgeries. Our current approach actually has been focused on geographic access, providing surgery in as many centers as possible close to where people live. But most of these are elective procedures, and the things we have wait lists for, hip and knee and so forth, are also elective. So concentrating, this, concentrating in a few locations to get high volumes and delegating tasks may be able to reduce costs and wait times. Okay, now within our health system, 1% of patients generate one-third of costs, and 5% of patients generate two-thirds of cost. Despite the enormous expense, it's not clear that these people are getting good care or that we are getting good value. So we need a different way to address the problems of people with multiple psychiatric, medical, and social problems. So this is where the solution shop comes in. Now, if we think the classic model for complex patients is you send them to a tertiary hospital, and they, see, they go and see a specialist. They see one specialist for every condition. The specialist writes up a note to say what, they need, what needs to be done, unaware of what everyone else has recommended. That information comes back to the family doctor who has to make sense of the jumble, family doctor like me, makes sense, who has to make sense of that jumble and present it to a patient in 15 minutes. As you might imagine, it's a painful experience for all concerned. Now, my colleague Ross Upshur at uh, Sunnybrook Hospital has created something called the Impact Clinic, and that's a real solution shop. In this model, uh, the, an entire family health team, including an internist and sometimes a psychiatrist, sits around a table while one of the members of the team interviews a patient on the screen. 
as they are interviewing the patient, they are able to sort out all the problems, discuss amongst each other, and eventually basically come up with a plan. Often these patients will have 10 problems, and they will sort, prioritize them, present them back to the patient and their caregiver to come up with an integrated plan going forward. In the process, many unnecessary tests and treatments are excluded. Uh, one of my colleagues, Howie uh, Abrams, who works in this clinic as an internist, he says his main job is to just cancel things. Say, cardiologist, <laughs> he said, recommended this, you don't need that. You don't need this test, you don't need that drug. And that's really his job, and as an internist, he's got the confidence to recommend that. So the advantage here for patients is that they don't have to go to the clinic nine times, and for providers, you actually sort through the problems for once. In the standard 15-minute visit, I've got to tell you, these patients, pardon me, are like a heart sink. In 15 minutes, you can just barely get through the surface of it. But like this, with a team where we collaborate and learn from each other, we can actually figure out what's best for these patients. All right, now let's go to the last model, the facilitated network. So the standard model of care for someone like Jane, who's 80 years old, lives alone, and is suffering from Alzheimer's, is that her, her daughter Sandy takes her to all her appointments, tries to keep track of what all, all her medications do, uh, attempts to deal with daily issues as they come up and her, as her mother's autonomy gradually declines and she slowly burns out. Now Sandy recently found a website called Ties. This website is like a social networking website where you invite people who are in the network of loved ones to join a site. That site allows you to organize information around a person, in this case Jane, uh, pr propose and uh, sign up for tasks, and uh, store vital information like your will, your uh, medical record, and health information in a vault for those who are closest to that person. So after Sandy joined Ties, her network shifted. And now she still goes to the patient, she still takes her mother to her appointments, still takes care of the medications, but her brother Paul, Paul takes care of the finances, her neighbor Jim takes care of home repairs and lawn work, uh, Rex goes for a walk with her every day, and Jenny helps take care of the cat. And Petra, uh, who lives in another province, uploads pictures and keeps her updated on what's going on with the family. This type of network is able to share the care and lower, lessen the burden on, uh, on someone like Sandy. Unfortunately, as our system progresses, we are shifting more and more care onto families and their care, onto patients and their caregivers, and they need networks like this to, to support them. So, getting more value doesn't mean cutting. It means restructuring and finding new ways to do things that are cheaper and more accessible. Many of these approaches are being developed in places like India. And now I'm screening over a thousand examples to see what we can learn from places that can't afford to be as wasteful as we are. You are all part of the healthcare system. And it's possible together to look at uh, by de it's possible to support innovative approaches that reduce costs rather than demanding expensive treatments and, and uh, technologies. We have a role as care providers, patients, and payers, ultimately, to create a system that is sustainable together. Thank you.